Through everything you face in life, stress and joy, confusion and gratitude, comfort and distress, look to the Lord and start building a habit of seeking Him with Closer to God Each Day, 365 Daily Devotions. This year-long devotional will help you build up your spiritual strength. A few moments can transform your day. A daily habit in God's Word can transform your life. think it's possible that your soul could work the same way as your body? Do you think it's possible that the way God designed your character to grow is the same way he designed your muscles to grow? Do you think it's possible that you could only get spiritually to certain places if you had first passed through the difficulties of pain, suffering, and hardship? And if so, do you think it's possible that just like my wife who comes back from the gym, instead of lamenting and complaining and grumbling, you could actually get to a place where you appreciate the suffering you go through because you've learned and taught yourself that it leads to really great spiritual places? Those are the questions I want to explore with you today. As we open this book, the Bible Uh, we're going to try to see how God works not just through the good days that we have, but through the bad ones. Not just through the celebration and the pleasure, but also through the suffering and the pain. Now, before I dive in, I, I should admit this. To learn to be grateful for the hard times of your life will be immensely more difficult than the struggle of the gym. And here's why. When you go to the gym, you are mostly in control of the amount of pain that you feel. Right? If my wife doesn't like the burn, she can slow down, she can stop, she can skip a workout, she can cancel the membership. She's in control of the duration and the degree of that pain. But you've probably come to realize that life isn't like that. If you've been through something or you're going through something difficult right now, you realize that you don't have the power and you don't have the control and you don't just look up to heaven and say, okay, God, and it stops. I mean, if you've struggled with middle school or high school, like the the pressure of homework and AP classes and GPA and getting into college and keeping up and the the competition and the parts and the sports, like, you would love to just say, okay, okay, I'm done with the pressure. I felt overwhelmed long enough. But life doesn't work that way. Uh, If you've had financial struggles, you can't say, okay, I'm done being homeless. I'm done crashing at a friend's house. I'm, I'm done with this credit card debt. Life doesn't work that way. If you've struggled with dating and romance, and you're sick of being lonely, or you're sick of, you know, the struggles and the arguments and the fights, and you just want to say, okay, God, now push the button so I can have happily ever after. Life doesn't work that way. And I could give you a thousand more examples. If you're battling depression or anxiety, uh, if you've been through a divorce or lost someone that you love, uh, all of us would love to say to pain, okay, that's about enough. But that's not how life works. But that's why today we're going to find some help in this book. Today we're going to open our Bibles to Romans chapter 5. And the Apostle Paul, a guy who was incredibly grateful and went through an incredible amount of suffering, is going to help us to thank God even in the midst of pain. So if you want to follow along on the screen or you have a Bible with you, let's open up to Romans chapter 5 where Paul kicks off with these words. Therefore, Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, that is Christ, we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. That means if you're a follower of Jesus, and if you're not, you can trust in him today, like you stand in the place called grace. 
that you wake up and you're loved and you mess up and you're still loved. <laughs> and tomorrow when you wake up, whether it's a good day or a terrible day, you're still, still loved because Paul says we stand in grace. We thank God for every eternal blessing and every spiritual blessing. And then Paul gets to the pain. Check out these epic words from verses three and four. He continues, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. If you don't know what God produces through the harder days of your life, all you will do is vent and grumble and beg him that they would stop. You're kind of like the woman who goes to the gym, but she doesn't know how her body gets better. And so when she's suffering and when she's sweating and when the instructor is pushing her and pushing her, she doesn't know that pain leads to growth. And so all she does is complain. But if you know how the body works, the Apostle Paul says, even then you can boast in your suffering. So grab your pen and let's look at what Paul says happens when God allows pain in our lives. Filling in blanks here. Paul says, first of all, that pain produces perseverance. Pain produces perseverance. Uh, my simple definition of perseverance is the ability to not quit. Like, you have a bad day, but you don't quit. And when you think about it, perseverance is such an important thing in your life because if you don't learn to persevere, you will lose out on some of the best gifts that God has to give. I mean, think of church or think of dating or think of family or think of friendships. Imagine a person who quits the first time it gets hard. What will they end up with in life? Can you imagine, parents, if you had kids and you'd keep them and love them, but the first time they didn't make you happy? <laughs> there would be a lot of kids locked outside of a lot of homes, right? No, because you, ha I mean, you, you can't quit. There's really, even at church, right? If, if you like loved coming to our church, but the first time I'd said something that offended you, the first time one of the, one of the saints here at the core sinned against you, if you bolted, you, you would never find a church home. So pain is when you go through something difficult in life, but you don't quit. You don't give up. And once that produces perseverance in you, here's the next thing Paul says, that that perseverance produces character. You end up becoming the kind of person who has passed the test and who knows that they can get through it. Well, like a, a few church services where I'm not getting a ton out of it, I can get through that without quitting. A week or a month or a season of a relationship where it's not all like butterflies and magic and sprinkles, I can get through that. Disagreements with people who are pushing me and not being nice to me, but I don't lash out or, or snap back, like, I, I can get through that. You'll never know if you pass that test until you actually take it. And so pain produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character. And Paul eventually says that character leads to hope. Christians who develop this kind of character, they know that they have a great future with God. And so they're strong, they can endure, they hold on to their faith, they don't burn bridges, they end up saying things like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's Paul's process. If you know that, if you remember what pain produces, perseverance, character, and hope, you won't give up and you won't give in, you won't grumble, you might teach your own heart to be grateful even on the harder days. It kind of makes me think of Fanny Crosby. I'll show you a picture of her. Ever heard about Fanny Crosby before? It's a scary picture. Those are her dark tinted glasses because Fanny Crosby, who lived about 100 years ago, died at the age of 94, was blind her entire life. Uh, she got sick when she was about six weeks. She lost her sight and for the next 94 years, she never regained it. But Fanny Crosby had an incredible faith. 
Did you know that Fanny Crosby wrote more Christian songs than Martin Luther, Chris Tomlin, and Hillsong combined? By the time she died at age 94, she had written over 8,000 hymns and songs of Christian praise. 8,000. <laughs> she was so good at what she did that the people who collected and published hymnals in those days were embarrassed <laughs> that their hymnals were almost entirely Fanny Crosby songs. And so she literally wrote under multiple names so that hymnal gatherers could say, well, it's not just Fanny's work. <laughs> Fanny, you would think, would be mad at God. To live 94 years, how many times do you think she prayed? And yet never once did she see. But she didn't grumble. Now, this woman was crazy grateful. Now, let me show you something that Fanny Crosby once said. She wrote, It seemed intended by the blessed providence of God that I should be blind all my life. And I thank him for the dispensation. If perfect earthly sight were offered me tomorrow, I would not accept it. I might not have sung hymns to the praise of God if I had been distracted by the beautiful and interesting things about me. Now that's faith. Huh? Do you know how old Fanny Crosby was when she wrote those words? Eight. <laughs> a third grader said that. If God would give me back my sight, I'd say, no, thank you. Because I don't want to be distracted from the one thing that matters more than anything else. Singing praise out of a grateful heart to God. And it might seem crazy, but brothers and sisters, you can end up in the same place. Fanny Crosby had the same father, the same savior, the same spirit, the same book, the same opportunity to talk to God in prayer. And you can end up with her faith if you don't forget. If you know, like the Apostle Paul did, what God does through moments of pain. If you know that God is still at work and he still has a plan, even if your season has been very, very bad. If you know, even on the days that you hurt, that God has not turned on you or broken his promises to you, if you know that, you can have the kind of faith that is grateful to God even when life is hard. You can be the kind of Christian who says, I, I know that God is still for me. The Christian who says, I know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. The Christian who says, I know that I can do all things through the God who strengthens me. I know that God has plans for me and I know those plans are not to harm me. I know that God has hope for me and I know that God has a future for me. I know I'm not going to forget it. My, my body hurts. My family is messed up. This is broken. I'm sitting in a jail cell, but here is what I know, that God is with me and God is for me and God has a plan for me. And if you know that, you stop just saying, God, thank you for the food and thank you for the forgiveness and you start saying the craziest thing in the world, thank you, God, for the pain. Because when you get to that spot, you realize that your soul is a lot like your body. If you're holding on to a pen right now or your phone, could you set that down for just a second? If you're watching at home, can you put down your remote, your device? Because I need you to do something with me. I need you to flex. All right, I'll wait for you. Let's see the muscles. Oh, Gunner, holy cats, put those things away. Yep, all right, show it to the neighbor next to you. All right, grab onto your biggest bicep. Go. Guys, you're enjoying this a little bit too much out there. <laughs> so <laughs> at my house, we Novotnys are not the strongest people you'll ever meet. So the girls and I love to strut around the house and flex a lot. So we have invented something that we call the BBC, the Big Bumps Club. Yep. <laughs> so the girls and I were always flexing in front of each other. Um, squeeze your muscle for a second. Do you know how a muscle like this, your bicep, gets bigger? Two things. Use that bicep to pick up your pen again and write this down. If you're going to grow physically, what you need is stress and rest. Just physically, 
biologically, what makes a muscle grow is when you stress it more than it's used to being stressed. Like you can't just pick up your phone a few extra times. Uh, you have to actually push it so hard and the muscle fiber gets so stressed that microscopically it tears. Right? So when, while you, when you go back to the gym and your muscles aren't used to it, oh, you can barely get off the couch or you help a friend move uh, to a new apartment, use muscles you haven't used in a long time before, you have to stress in ways that your body is not used to. And the fibers tear, and then, that doesn't make you stronger by itself, you need rest. You have to take a day or two off of the gym, you have to work out another group of muscles, you have to sleep, you have to eat enough protein, get enough nutrition, and then your body, when it repairs those microscopic tears, makes them bigger and bigger and bigger, and you end up stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's kind of how faith works too. If God just gave you the same old stress that you had last year, you would not grow. He has to allow a new challenge, a new stage of life, something you're not used to, something your soul isn't accustomed to. And I know you wish that wasn't the case, but it's true. Like, if you could handle it, you wouldn't need God to handle it. <laughs> if you could just whip, whip this off and tackle this challenge while opening that book or folding these hands, you wouldn't grow spiritually. But if something challenges you so much that you say, God, I, I, I can't, it will break you down. Your self-assurance and your confidence, your self-righteousness, God will, not microscopically, but macroscopically, tear you apart a bit and then, he can feed you and he can heal you and he can strengthen you. Look at these last words we're going to study from Romans 5. Paul says, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's love has been poured out into your heart. Like, if you thought that you were suffering with an addiction because God turned on you and didn't love you, if you thought that you're sitting in a jail cell or dealing with a breakup or still grieving his loss because God was against you or he hated you, Paul says, no, 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 no. God's love has been poured out into our hearts. Like, the Holy Spirit himself, given from God, is pointing us towards Jesus and saying, no, God loves you. He still loves you. You're hurting, but he loves you. <laughs> Don't forget what we studied last week. Through Jesus Christ, you are chosen, you're holy, you're blameless, you're predestined, you're adopted, you're graced, you're redeemed, you're forgiven, you're included, you're saved, you're marked, you're filled, you're an heir of eternal life, you are God's own possession. God is so good to you and his love is so intense for you, don't let this pain convince you of anything else. Hope has been poured out into our hearts and so even while we suffer, we know we have this rest but I'm good with God. Life might stress you, it might push you, it, it might tear at your soul, but let the love of God poured into your heart heal you and make you stronger than you were before. So, to help that happen, I want to leave you with just a little bit of homework. It's our last blank if you're taking notes. I want you, the next time you're suffering, the next time you're finding it very hard to be grateful, to dial 511. All right, that's my fancy way of saying it. I want you to read three parts of the Bible, Romans chapter 5, James 1, and 1 Peter 1. So maybe you're suffering, maybe you're kind of new to the Bible. <laughs> it's a big book, <laughs> 66 books, how many chapters, 31,000 different verses. Like, where do you go when you're in pain? Here's what I say, dial 511. Romans 5, we just studied. In James 1, uh, Jesus' brother says, consider it pure joy when you face trials because we know that the testing of our faith develops perseverance. In 1 Peter 1, Jesus' close friend Peter says, hard times come to prove the genuineness of our faith and it results in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter and Paul and James want to remind you so you know what God does through pain. So the next time you're hurting, don't just sit and stew. Dial 511 and let the Holy Spirit pour truth and hope and love into your heart. 
so that maybe you can do something you've never done before and say, thank you, God. Even now. Even for this. That's what Fanny Crosby did. I'd invite our musicians forward and uh, they're going to help us sing our amen to this message. Uh, When Fanny Crosby was 55 years old, she had lived with almost 55 years of blindness. But instead of grumbling why God hadn't fixed her problem, she picked up her pen and wrote one of her most famous songs, a song called To God Be the Glory. When I was a kid growing up in church, this was one of the songs we sang all the time that we're going to praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. We're going to celebrate the goodness of God. I sang that song how many times as a kid, but what I never knew was that it was written by a woman who lived with incredible pain. And in the song, Fanny Crosby said, even now, I have a reason to sing. Even now, I have a reason to praise And she said, on that day when I see Jesus, (laughs) when he opens my eyes for the first time, I will praise him again. But it will not be the first time because I already started to praise God in the midst of my pain. So I want to invite you to please stand. And today as we think about all the drama in our families, with our mental health, with our finances, our fertility, our grief, our loss, as we battle addictions, as we sit in jail cells, wherever we are, today we're going to join Fanny Crosby and sing as people of faith. So as you catch on to the lyrics of her famous song, join Jonathan and Caitlin and let's sing praises to God. To God be the glory, great things he has done. He so loved the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin. Dear God, you have done great things for us. Uh, The fact that we stand right now in grace, that everyone who trusts in Jesus is so insanely and unconditionally loved that we will never get to the end or the bottom of it. We thank you for that, God. We thank you that all the struggles of this life, all the pain that we go through cannot touch the promise that you have made that everyone who believes in your son has life that will never end. And we thank you, God, that pain doesn't get the last word with you. You use it to refine us and to change us and to make us stronger. That our suffering is not in vain. That our work, God, of trusting in you and seeking you in those moments, it it connects us with people 
that we wouldn't have met before. It gives us experience and expertise that we wouldn't have had before. It allows us to prove that you are a God who is good, not just because you give good things, but because you yourself are the source of goodness. And so God, boldly, we push back against the enemy and his lies and we praise you today. If it's a good day, <laughs> bad day, it doesn't matter the day, God, we praise you because you're you and you're with us and you're always working for the good of those who love you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would protect everyone who's here today. Jesus, you said that we'd have many troubles in this world and we just don't know what's going to happen this week or this year or this decade. We don't know if it's going to get easier or harder. So protect us from the temptation. Help us to know and to remember what kind of God you are and what kind of good things you do. Protect your people. Bless your church. And help us to say thank you, God, for everything. We pray this all, Jesus, in your beautiful, powerful, and sufficient name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for that reminder that growth comes from stress and rest. And God sometimes allows trouble in our life to grow our faith. If you're seeking ways to get closer to God, we're offering this month our 365-day daily devotional, Closer to God Each Day. It'll get you in God's word and help you to experience his presence. Request your copy with your financial gift to Time of Grace. Visit us at timeofgrace.org, write to us, or call the number on the screen. Through everything you face in life, stress and joy, confusion and gratitude, comfort and distress, look to the Lord and start building a habit of seeking Him with Closer to God Each Day, 365 daily devotions. This year-long devotional will help you build up your spiritual strength. A few moments can transform your day. A daily habit in God's Word can transform your life. Closer to God Each Day, 365 daily devotions is our way of thanking you for your financial support. Request yours today by calling 800-661-3311, visiting timeofgrace.org, or writing us at P.O. Box 301, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53201. Nothing matters more than connecting people to God. Like that anxious teenager scrolling on her phone, who doesn't really know who Jesus is, or that family that might look good from a distance, but they're barely keeping it together, or that Christian going through chemo, who needs to know that she is going to see the face of God. Nothing matters more than connecting people just like that to the God of forgiveness, love, and power. And that is exactly what Grace Partners do. Grace Partners give regularly and generously to Time of Grace. Join me today in becoming a Grace Partner. Time of Grace doesn't end here. Visit timeofgrace.org and explore encouraging resources or sign up for our daily email and have everything delivered right to your inbox. Like our Grace Moments devotions, Grace Talks devotional videos, blog, and podcasts. Follow us on social media where you'll find a supportive Christian community. Do you need prayer? Contact us and let us know what's on your heart. Thank you so much for your support. See you next week on Time of Grace.